Our Across the Aisle segment tonight, liberals have no shame. After Congress voted to repeal Obamacare, liberal activists are now staging mock funerals and even going so far as to ship people's ashes to Republican lawmakers. Now, liberals love to criticize President Trump's rhetoric, but isn't this far worse? With me now, former Georgia State Representative, Democratic strategist LaDon Jones. LaDon, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Liz. Listen, LaDon, we talked about this on the show yesterday, actually, sort of the hyperbole uh, in rhetoric that we're seeing from Democrats. You know, ev everything across the board, whether it's abortion, Obamacare, sanctuary cities, the border wall, you name it, the Democrats' response right now is, well, people are going to die if we follow Republicans' policy here. And let me ask you, as a Democrat, someone who I think, uh, for the most part, disagrees with what Republicans are trying to push through policy-wise, don't you think that hyperbole is a little extreme? Well, it's no more extreme than we're going to have these death panels that they told everyone would happen if you were a senior citizen um, when they were pushing through Obamacare, right? Um, uh, I definitely think that all of those things will, will, were used before and they're tactics that are used now. But here's the difference. We know sincerely in this case, in there will be people who cannot be covered. If you remove the protections that are currently in Obamacare, there will be people who actually suffer. Right, but I mean, there there is coverage in this in this uh, Republican alternative to Obamacare, and you you know we've talked about this before. I'm no fan of that bill, but there there are provisions to cover people with pre-existing conditions. The mandate doesn't go away from Obamacare, and if states apply for that waiver to be exempt from that mandate, they have to have high risk pools. I mean, there will be the opportunity for everybody to be covered. Yes, but then you have states here, like Georgia, where I am, where I was in the General Assembly, and we had an opportunity to expand Medicaid and Medicare. We didn't do that. I believe that same General Assembly would not uh, jump into these um, expansions. And what's crazy about it is we just had a story here in Georgia where they're closing more rural hospitals. And so people who are further away from our urban areas are having a hard time getting medical care, and they didn't even realize, the legislators from there, that by not expanding Medicare, they could have helped to provide that health care. I think they're going to vote against their right. interests now. It's like they did before. Right, and the but result in regards to the rural hospitals, if you don't mind my interrupting for a moment, I mean, that was part of that was part of what was built into Obamacare. They wanted to condense hospitals. They wanted them to be larger hospitals at further distances. That is entirely Obamacare to blame. But, I mean, it, states don't just have a choice of not to set up those high-risk pools. They won't be granted the waiver from the mandate of, uh, of covering people with pre-existing conditions unless they set up those high-risk pools first. I don't understand why Democrats don't think that'll cover people. Well, they, the um, budget office has taken a look, and the amount of money that will be covered um, by some of the states may not be enough to cover the high-risk pool. The mandate does not ensure that states will completely cover. We have to remember, each of our states are in different conditions. Each of our states are still suffering from other issues, um, cultural issues, socioeconomic issues. We have, in Michigan, the water issue, right? And because of those budget constraints, at the end result, I am concerned that states are not going to be able to provide the resources for all of their citizens. Sure. Part of what made Obamacare work is everybody being in, everybody being sure, involved. Sure, and well, let me ask you, I mean, how many people, Obamacare, you're right, one of the premises of Obamacare is that every single person in our country would be covered, everyone would participate, everyone would pay into the system for the most part, unless you got subsidies. How many people uh, are still uninsured under Obamacare after all these years? Well, there's a number of people uninsured, particularly in those states where um, where Medicaid was not expanded. Um, that made it even more difficult for people to not be involved in uh, in what coverage. But here's what here's another issue with the bill for those people who are not covered. Maybe it's some financial reason why they can't afford coverage. You go from Obamacare. But, uh, I mean, Obamacare was supposed to cover that. If somebody couldn't afford it, they were supposed to apply for subsidies. I mean, do you know the number of people that still don't have health insurance coverage? They either choose to pay the penalty or they don't pay the penalty and they still don't follow the law. I mean, do you know how many millions of people are still uninsured, even when Obamacare tells them that they have to be? And you know what? And that's the beauty about America. That's part of what, you know, I felt like made the bill fair. You decide to take a chance. You know what your penalty would be. You decide not to sign up for it. That's a much smaller group of people than overall. Now, under Trump care, if you, for whatever reason, don't pay, whether it's by choice or by force, you're left in the hands of corporate insurance industries to say, now we're going to out price you 
out of the uh, out of the cost. Maybe you were a single woman without kids and you decide to then get it. And they're going to say you had a pre-existing condition. And so we're going to charge you so much that you don't sign up. No, that no, that, is, that's another that's another point I want to bring up, because this one this one, I think, um, is, is particularly egregious. This I think I don't know why Democrats actually tolerate the use of this talking point. But when they say that rape is a pre-existing condition, if you've been raped, if you've gone through that trauma, if you have injuries from it, rape is a pre-existing condition and you won't be covered. You, you understand that that's false, correct? I don't know if that's false or not, but I know that there are a lot of pregnancy and other related conditions that are not covered by this new Trump care. No, no. I mean, it is 100 percent false. First of all, rape is not a medical condition. Injuries sustained by rape, chronic injuries sustained by rape can qualify as a pre-existing condition. Ladon, it qualifies as a pre-existing condition under Obamacare, too. Nothing is changing under the Republicans' alternative. Right. But the difference is under Obamacare, it had to be covered under Trump care because you were raped due to no fault of your own. Now, the states, if they choose not to get this waiver, if they choose not to fund that, if they decide not to support that, will be able to say the insurance companies can charge you triple the amount because of a rape. So what do we want? No, Women not to that's what I'm saying. Things? That's what I don't understand. You're missing you're missing a very important piece of this puzzle. Nobody on either side of the aisle wants to not have coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. It's actually a little bit absurd to me. It's childish to me that Republicans and Democrats don't come together better on this because we do share this one opinion, this one philosophical thing about health care. We want to have coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. Because of this, I don't understand why Democrats are ignoring the high-risk pools, why they're ignoring the fact that the mandate under Obamacare is not going away. States can merely apply to the Secretary of Health and Human Services for a waiver, but before that waiver is granted to them, they must prove to the federal government that they are going to have these high-risk pools and that money is in this bill to fund that. Why are Democrats ignoring that? Because fool me once, shame on you. The same states that did not expand under Obamacare are going to be the same states that are not going to provide the coverage that is needed. I am one of those people who lives in one of those states. Both of my parents died as a result of cancer. And I'm certain that had they been able to get the health care that they needed much earlier on, that this may have been preventable or their life would have been extended. I don't trust Georgia to ensure that the rest of the citizens will have that right. And I mean, let's just be frank. There's some states that would be great. Maybe I need to move to New York. But right now, Georgia is <laughs> not going to do it. Well, right. I mean, the, the policies under the Democratic Party in New York or California is certainly the place to live because those are the coastal areas that they're looking out for. I mean, I'm extremely sorry for your loss, for your parents. My grandparents, you know, passed away from cancer as well, from Alzheimer's, and it, it is a tragedy. I think the rules of life for the way the life works, people died before Obamacare, people died under Obamacare, and people died after Obamacare. We live in a world, you know, where... People do die. People die of illnesses, and it's tragic. But if you look at the numbers, I think we have to put that emotion aside for a second because if you look at that numbers, I mean, how much how much higher are people's premiums who have pre-existing conditions under Obamacare than they were before? Because for as many stories as like yours that you tell, there are just as many anecdotes from people who say, well, before Obamacare, I paid this much, and now I'm paying triple the amount for half of the coverage with an enormous deductible, so really I'm just paying out of pocket. I mean, there are just as many stories that point in that direction. And that's true. But so that you outlined the fundamental difference between Republicans and Democrats. And Democrats strongly believe that in a country as rich as America, although we all have to put into the pot, we are willing to put in a little bit more to save your grandmother and my parents. We're willing to put a little bit more in the pot for our public safety, for our military. We're willing to put a little bit more in the pot to make sure our highways are together rather than, oh, me, oh, my, I have to pay a little bit more, so I'm sad. And that's the difference. No, and, and that's, that's, that's a Democratic, I mean, that's a Democratic talking point, with all due respect. That's not something that accurately reflects the Republican policy initiatives, certainly not the heart and mind of the Republican Party as individuals. It just, at what point, I guess my question is, do you put ideology aside and look at what works? Because if you're sitting here telling me that Obamacare works, with all due respect, again, that's a fairly elitist attitude because there are a lot of people, and like I can do the same thing as you do, a lot of working people, a lot of single moms, a lot of families that are struggling to put food on the table whose premiums have been jacked up by an average of 25%, sometimes as much as 116% they're not able to afford what they need. So at what point do we put ideology aside and say, hey, Obamacare, it may have had fine, it may have had fine motivations behind it, but it simply doesn't work for a lot of Americans. I, I agree. And so, well, let me say this. So to, to find a point of agreement, I listened to Governor Kasich and some of his ideas that he put forward, and they sounded brilliant. But unfortunately, some of the things that he said 
um, does not comport with um, the Republican talking point of repealing Obamacare. You can tell just by the way that the bill is set up. The first thing they attack is Planned Parenthood on page one. On page three, they're talking about Medicaid. And it's the same story that we hear again and again. There are some good ideas out there. And I do think that it's worth everybody taking a step back. And I think Republicans who are now in control, what I would say is, listen to the, if you're in control, listen to the people who make common sense like Kasich and make sure that your party is doing things that's for the betterment and right. not just so that say we won. No, I don't, I don't disagree. What I, what I guess bothers me is people like Bette Midler, and I want to show this tweet on the screen really quickly before we go. She tweeted this. She said, so the hashtag homegrown Assads in the Freedom Caucus want employers to not have to offer health care to employees, like gassing their own people. I mean, LaDawn, it's awfully difficult for Republicans and Democrats to come together when this is the attitude, this is the mindset, this is the hyperbole, these are the threats coming from the Democratic Party. It doesn't look like they even want to find common ground. They just are so anti-Trump. They're so committed to spewing this message that Republicans are evil that we can't even come up with a solution. Maybe so, but Bette Midler, as beautiful as she is, is not an elected party. So we've sent people oh, thank down goodness. to the Capitol to, to represent us. Those are the people who we ask that you listen to and take down the partisan signs and not tweet. Now, we'll listen to Donald Trump's tweets because he won, right? But Bette Midler, her tweets don't count in this fight. I don't know. She's an, she's an American citizen. I think we have to listen to everybody. Well, Don, thanks for coming on the show. It's always great to talk to you.